gold and silver are alloidal title. And what that means is when you physically hold it, you own it. It's yours. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Ron's Basement. I'm joined today by Mr. Pat Holland. He's an instrumental figure in working to help Missouri and some other states get gold and silver re-recognized as legal tender within the states. And you know, as we think about this, what we're really trying to do is give people on a state by state basis an option, another option besides just keeping their money in the US dollar. So I thought I'd talk to Pat on his thoughts about the US dollar and, you know, possibly why people may want to consider silver and gold precious metals as a way to maintain value to preserve wealth. Pat, thank you again for joining us today. You bet. Thank you, Ron, for having me back in the basement today. Appreciate you, buddy. I I appreciate you too. So when I think about the U.S. dollar, I get a little nervous, right? We could talk about this for hours and days. You know, there's, we have the national debt, right? We have all the money printing that's gone on. We have the, the fundamentals of mathematics that just uh, don't make sense when we look at the dollar, and uh, it's a little scary. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and that's why I wanted to bring you on and, and get your thoughts and kind of see, uh, get your perspective on what's going on in the world and the dollar. So uh, have at it, my friend. We're very curious to hear what you have to say. Gotcha. Well, uh, I don't know where to start. <clears throat> <laughs> this is actually something that I'm a little familiar with. Um, the dollar, uh, when the Federal Reserve took over in 1913, was like a, a wonderful, wonderful, I don't know if you guys like blueberry pie, I love blueberry pie, uh, like a wonderful blueberry pie. And, it, you know, it was, you know, it was so, it was so perfectly baked, and it was just cooling off. And, and that was the dollar in 1913. Now, the dollar is that tiny, tiny sliver left of that blueberry pie on that pie pan that no one wants to finish off because then they have to wash the pie pan. Uh, That's what the dollar is, is been reduced to at this point. Uh, In fact, there's lots of estimates between 6% and 3% left of the dollar's value compared to what it was worth or the value of it in 1913 when the federal reserve took over. Um, So let's default to 3%. So basically Okay, and and once again, this has to do with nominal confusion and what a dollar is worth because, you know, I usually take out a dollar and I show people what is this worth and they'll say it's a dollar. But uh, so I'll say, okay, so I'll bring up something, another item, and I'll say, you know, what's that worth? You know, like this, this headlamp and I'll say, what's this worth? And they'll say, oh, that's worth about $20. And I'll say, that's very interesting. And they'll say, why? I said, because you compared the dollar to itself, but you compared the headlamp to the dollar another you can you know one commodity for another commodity but you never compare the dollar to barrels of oil ounces of gold you know basically anything you know uh, bushels of corn you never compare the dollar to anything else and that's why people are confused about inflation because twenty dollars in 1950 is twenty dollars today right yeah. Yep. But the purchasing yep. power is what you've <laughs> lost. That's why that pie analogy I gave you earlier is pivotal, because that twenty dollar bill was an entire pie in 1913. But now the twenty dollar bill is a tiny, tiny sliver of what was left of that blueberry pie now. So, so in let's say 1920, <clears throat> if I had one dollar. Uh, I could go out and get a nice meal with that dollar. Is yep, that correct? You sure could. You sure and could. And today, I mean, a really nice meal, right? A steak, a bottle of wine, uh, you know, a nice, a nice dinner. Uh, today, with that dollar, I, I think at my local McDonald's, you can still get one of those tiny little shrunken down, like basic hamburgers they sell That's right. for for one dollar. Now, that sounds about right. now. In 1920, uh, we had silver dollars, right? Right. So if I if I had you if I if I had held on to that silver and carried it through to today, the silver would be worth 
oh, about $23, $25, right? So I could use that silver value mm-hmm. uh, to go out and buy a decent meal today. Yes. Uh, so the paper loses its value and not, not to make this a video about silver and gold, but the, the metal or the real asset maintains its value. And, right. and, I, and I think it's, I love that term nominal confusion because I think 98% of the people in the country have suffer nominal from confusion, that. have mm-hmm. nominal confusion, right? Like I have a hundred grand in my checking account on January 1st of 2021. On mm-hmm. January 1st of 2022, I still have a hundred grand in my checking account. Maybe I made $50 in interest or something like that. However, so they think, oh, I still have a hundred thousand, which they do, right? But mm-hmm. they've lost 10% of their buying power. They don't well, they don't yeah. they don't realize that they would now need 110,000 to buy the same thing a year later that they could have bought a year previous. Absolutely. In fact, I'd love to bring up the housing market, you know, and once again is another uh, co- commodity, another asset to the housing market which is largely a paper market because you can't get a house without getting a bank loan. So that's why I call the housing market a paper market. Um back in the 90s I mean, Ron, you're you and I are the same age, man. Back mm-hmm. in the '90s, you could get yourself a really nice home for seventy five thousand dollars, right? In Missouri, no, I'm talking Missouri here. I'm not going to be saying other states because I don't know. Right. Uh, but to get that same house today in Missouri, you're looking at two hundred thousand, yep. two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars to get that same home. That was 75 in the 90s. What's the difference? What changed? (laughs) They turned on the printing press. That's what changed. (laughs) Right. The value. Very simple. You know, and I'm going to, I'm going to shoot off. We're staying on the same subject, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take us on a little trip to China. Uh, I saw something on Twitter last night, and this was on the Chinese state television station. This clip (laughs) with this newscaster (laughs) saying, that it takes 17 cents for the uh, U.S. government to print a $100 bill, 17 cents. And they fact check right. all this. Yeah, 17 cents. And with that 17 cents, America is able to basically steal from the world. And this was That's on correct. Chinese state television. And people were they're like, wow, this is getting serious because the they may have known this for a long time, mm-hmm. but they weren't publicly saying it. And that's what they, they were telling their citizens, like, you know, the U.S. can spend 17 cents to print, you know, figuratively print that $100 bill. You and I know a lot of it's electronic now anyway, but nonetheless, mm-hmm. that they were sharing that with their, but then because there's a big movement and, and uh, right, the BRICS countries uh, yeah. <clears throat> on many that's levels. One. That's a yeah. big one moving to uh moving to moving away from the dollar and look i want to throw this in pat and ron uh are are united states citizens we live we live here right we're not um, against our country actually we're we're more probably in line with our founding fathers in a lot of the constitution the constitution did 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 stipulate that gold and silver were the only real monies uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Pat. That but, is correct. Uh, the Constitution was very specific about that. Gold and silver coinage were the only money. Yeah. So we're not against our country. We're kind of, in some ways, more just scared about what's going on out there. Well, you should and want be to, scared. And want to, and want to, and want to, and want to protect our, ourselves and our families mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, the little pile of wealth that we do have. So go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I just want to say it's a good idea to be scared, gang, because the Federal Reserve, whenever the United States borrows money, they create a very pretty piece of paper called a bond, and they pass that off to the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve prints whatever amount of money the U.S. government put on that bond, on that pretty piece of paper. And what no one seems to understand, I'm sorry, the average folks don't understand is the Federal Reserve is literally, literally creating money out of nothing. They have no money in the bank. They have a zero sum checking account that they are writing checks to the federal government on that they create the money with. It's that simple. And yes, yes, it is that criminal. You and I can get away with that with what's called a credit card. 
Okay, but here's the deal. Let's say that Ron has a credit card and he's been, you know, spending and spending and spending. He's making, you know, monthly payments on it, you know, so that he can still use his credit card. There you go. There you go, there you guys. Go. You can you can use that one all you want. That's my my kid's uh, credit card from the Junior Achievement Biz Town. So good gotcha. luck using those numbers. Sorry. <laughs> yep. So you could do that with a credit card only so much basically until the bank says, Oh geez, this guy's driven up his debt to, you know, $20,000. And then, and then you make a quick phone call and you say to the bank, Hey, listen, you know, I've been making my regular payments and I need more credit. I need you to raise the credit limit to $30,000. And the bank goes, uh, okay, oh, okay. All right. We'll go ahead and raise it. You have been making payments but they know you're getting to a point where you can't pay it back and you're going to become insolvent. That's what's going on with the U.S. government with raising the debt ceiling. They're calling the bank and they're saying, well, you know, we need more credit. And, uh, you know, the bank is getting a little bit nervous. In this yeah. case, the Federal Reserve is not nervous at all. And I will tell you why. The Federal Reserve is very happy with all the debt the U.S. creates because it makes the Federal Reserve very very powerful and they get to start calling the shots and believe you me we'll get into another video another time whenever we go to war believe me the central bank the central banks of the world are definitely how do i say this they're they're definitely um they encourage it they encourage I mean, war yeah well I, right yes and, and let me i want to back up like this right the federal reserve can print money uh whenever they want at their that's, fancy that's right and and to a certain extent, are we heading down a path where if the Fed is is printing make believe money, my viewers love when I call it unicorn fart dust, but whatever you know you want to call it, uh, and financing right, and, and, the, and the U.S. government is now basically borrowing from the Federal Reserve, and it's not supposed to be that way, right? I mean, it's well, not the original constitution said no obviously but yeah. the, the 16th amendment is you know basically the 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 federal reserve act is what That's caused right. the situation we're in right now and by the way that wasn't ratified and yeah. so that's an argument that goes you know from interesting and, yep and i don't want to get into that argument today right. but it is important that people know that there is a lot of confusion about this and the federal government has never been able to prove that this amendment to the constitution was ratified on christmas day in uh what was it uh, was it 1912 or something like that or 1911 uh the federal reserve of course created in 13 but that's correct it wasn't ratified there's a very good book about this called the men from jekyll island if i were prepared for it i would have pulled it off my bookshelf to show yeah. you but um a very good book um uh edward griffith i think was the author i've read it right. twice if you guys are readers um and also to uh uh the creature from jekyll island i'm creature. sorry that's what yeah. it's called right. if you guys have the time just you read can it. find videos on youtube that have synopsis of this book to explain how the federal reserve was created and even their stories about uh and it's not necessarily in the book but their stories about the titanic going down that is actually related to the creation of our federal reserve actually that's mm -hmm. an interesting story in itself it gets into the tinfoil hat wearing stuff but there were men on that boat that were steaming towards the united states to get there in time to shut down the creation of the federal reserve that was wow. their, the very, very wealthy men that knew what was happening, you know, in the United States with the creation of that bank. Christmas Day. That's Is that correct. correct? Okay. Yes. Well, I'll, yes, leave, I'll right. leave that alone. Mike, I won't even, we won't even go there. I'll let my viewers. There were you know, only six, there were only six senators there to get that passed, by the way, on Mary, Christmas Day. They stayed behind. Merry, Merry Christmas, America. Um <laughs> In theory, and, and we could go way down this rabbit hole, but the way the system set up could could wouldn't this eventually, especially now that like the level of debt, everything's snowballing, right? Yeah. Couldn't in theory, like the Federal Reserve wind up in effectively almost owning the whole country? Is That's that, exactly that, right. That's I exactly mean, well, right? more specifically, uh, you look at who owns the central bank or right. Federal Reserve, and that's the member banks. There's six banks, yeah. but who owns them? And if you take the time to go through this, it all goes back to the Rothschilds. Now, it's a very, very, yeah. it's a family, a very rich family. 
that is probably on the top. It's the capstone, if you will, of the power elite in the world. They are wow. the capstone. And they own the member banks of every country, you know, through very complicated uh umbrella corporations and you know trusts and all kinds of stuff they own the member banks so and so 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 i have to interject because it's, it's just it it I, I can't stop myself here pat so go ahead the uh a way for an everyday person to protect themselves against this is owning physical assets that's correct silver and gold and yep. that's why you are so passionate in Missouri about SB 100, which uh, helps Missouri citizens reclaim their constitutional uh, right, right, to use gold yep. and silver as legal tender. Yep, and gold and silver are a loyal title. And what that means is when you physically hold it, you own it, it's yours. Ah. And so that's not true with the dollar. The dollar carries what's called third party risk. Right. Because it's faith and confidence from the United States government, and you have to believe that the Federal Reserve is going to be there two years from now. If you want to save in dollars, you have to believe that, number one, inflation is not going to hurt you, and inflation's hurting everybody, everybody. We're doing other things with our initiative, too. We're trying to get rid of sales tax on food in the state of Missouri. We're not just a gold and silver group, uh -huh. although that's our main project this year. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, gang, uh, third party risk is going to hurt you now. I mean, those of you who have, you know, lived in the United States, gosh, darn it. I mean, those living outside the United States, we're exporting inflation. Yeah. We, you know, we don't, we don't export, you know, just goods and services. We also export inflation. And some folks may say, well, how does that work? How, how can that possibly be? We're overprinting the dollar. You know, we're, we're sending a lot of it overseas. Believe me, we're exporting inflation. So other countries and their central banks have to turn on their printing presses to keep up with the Joneses, to keep up with the dollar, because they have dollar denominated debt that they have to make payments on. So they have yeah. to overprint their currency. If they don't, their country will become insolvent very, very quickly. So countries that do not have debt that are uh, that are involved in international trade using the dollar but they don't have debt are in a very very good position right now and there's mm -hmm. very very few countries in the world that can claim this russia's one of them by the way very yeah. very few uh, yeah. russia switzerland and i don't want to say lithuania uh, it's one of those so, tiny tiny european uh, nations i want to get your thoughts on this mm -hmm. it relates to what you just said you know, when I think about the U.S. dollar, and again, I'm a U.S. citizen. I want what's best for my country. This more scares me. When I think about the dollar, I think hegemony, most powerful currency in the world, obviously world reserve currency, 80, 85% of world trade is conducted in the dollar. That's correct. Um, I, I, I think about like, uh, can it get like it's like it's and it's been on a great run for the last, you know, whether you want to say since World War II, but even in the last 20, 30, 40 years, um, it can't get much better for the dollar, quote unquote, but there's a heck of a long way that it can fall, if that That's makes correct. sense. And and we've benefited, right? The whole I mean, we could go on for hours about the petrodollar, but we've been we've benefited because just just to look at oil, right? Oil since uh, what 1974, I think it was, or 1971. Uh, we've had the petrodollar. Most all of the oil in the world was traded in dollars. So when people got paid for oil, including Saudi Arabia, they had a lot of dollars. What did they do with them? They bought U.S. Treasuries, right? That's right? That and that financed the United States being able to uh, borrow a bunch of money. So if the Fed wasn't buying the, the Treasuries, the Saudis were buying the Treasuries. Now the world is changing, right? Mm -hmm. And same with China, right? Like mm -hmm. we bought a bunch of plastic stuff, and now even more advanced stuff from China, and so we would pay them in dollars. A lot of those dollars got recycled right back in they bought u.s treasuries but that's changing and, that's right um and, and the dollar uh potentially 
you know, I, it's a horrible, I'm, I'm full of horrible analogies, but I think of Walmart, right? Like Walmart has whatever, 5,000 stores across the United States, right? They've been on a good run for the last 50 years. They, 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 they aren't going to expand much more. They can't put on, put in too many more new stores. They have more potential to maybe, uh, you know what I mean? Like when something's gone on such a great run, uh, it, it's it's hard for it to continue to grow. It's a, maybe sometimes a lot easier for it to uh, to experience difficulty. Yep. And it feels like with geopolitically what's going on in the world, uh, whether you look at the BRICS as a whole, or you look at Russia, or you look at India, or you look at China, that that we're getting a lot of backlash. And these are not small countries, right? Uh, That's India correct. has. 1.4 billion people in a gr fast growing economy. China, That's right. I don't know how many people live in China, a billion, but uh, obviously- 1.3 1, 1. billion, maybe? 1.3 1. 1. billion. And, and, and when you look no, at- 1.7, maybe, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> but got a, a lot, lot of people. A heck of a lot more than 340 million to, or 300 million live in the United States. And these countries have, and, and their economies are growing and mm. they collectively- have a, if not a vast majority, a significant amount of the world's resources, it's scary. Sorry, yep. Pat. Let me give I'm you my two cents on this. Uh, and, and I'm going to go back to what you were talking about at the, at the beginning, which is we're the world reserve currency. We got it with uh, basically after World War II, the Bretton Woods Accords, uh, where it was decided uh, that the uh, world reserve currency was shifting from the pound which was the English, you know, dollar, if you will, to the American dollar. And the reason we were able to do this is World War II. We uh, did not get involved in the war until 1941, but in the late 30s, uh, we were actually the main manufacturer for all the military equipment and hardware for Europe to fight this, you know, this growing threat, Hitler. Yeah. And But the thing was, is we didn't take their money. I'm sorry, we didn't take their currency. We took their money. We took gold in payment for making airplanes, tanks, grenades, bullets, guns, because we didn't know if they were going to make it and if their currency was going to be worth anything a year from now. So we had to say, I'm sorry, you know, we have to take your gold in payment. And they said, hey, that's fine. We've got to fight this guy off because we won't be a country if, you know. So they figured, well, we'll give up our gold, you know, to, to get a chance to get rid of Hitler. Yeah. And so interesting. I didn't I didn't know that. Uh, yep. But that makes perfect sense. Well, that's that's what uh, developed Fort Knox. We didn't have Fort Knox before that. Uh, we were literally amassing an enormous amount of gold. Right. And so that's why, you know, I, I love the story the and story story that we have 7000 tons of gold in Fort Knox. That is absolutely patently false. Yet the federal government will still tell you it's true. And yeah. I can't remember the, the Treasury Secretary, what his name was again, that went in there uh, like uh, four years ago and maybe five years ago. Oh, First, Mnuchin? Yeah, Mnuchin. 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 Yep. Mnuchin. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, he tweeted, gold is safe. No pictures, <laughs> no evidence, no video. Uh, nothing. And the last time the Federal Reserve, I'm sorry, uh, last time the uh, Fort Knox was audited was 1953. Guys, our gold is gone. It's been pilfered. It is 100% gone. Yeah. I, I doubt it's even in this country. The gold is gone. We do not have anything to back up the dollar. Nothing. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, this is why we don't audit Fort Knox. 1953, 70 right. years ago, is the last time our gold supply was audited. You know, for those who... Uh, literally don't know about this. This is a fact. You can look this up online. You don't have to take Pat Holland's word for it. You don't have to take, you know, Rod's word for it. Look it up. Right. It's a fascinating study. And I, and, I, and I don't have a strong opinion about whether or not that gold is there. I know if you ask Google, it says it is, right? But right. why haven't they, I mean, 19, that's 70 years. That's correct. Wow. That's wow. the last that, time our gold supply was audited. And we tell the entire world we still have 7,000 <laughs> tons of gold. Wow. And Thanks, uh, but we don't provide any evidence of that, though. <laughs> Never. Well, certainly. It's, you just certainly, take us at our word, you know? Yeah, yeah just, we're good. We're, we're America. You can, you can trust us. You can trust our media. You can trust our government. Uh, I'll remind people around the world that watch Ron's basement. American citizens do not trust the government. 
by far and large. They don't trust the government and they don't trust the media. I'm sorry, you Lou, know, go ahead. Well, that's okay. I just, I, 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 yeah, I know he's, <laughs> yeah, Americans generally don't trust their politicians, um, mm-hmm. especially in Washington, D.C. And I always bring up the point um, because people, when any type of conflict breaks out throughout the world, everybody uh, is so supportive, like, rah, rah, yeah, let's go, let's go. And I say, well, if you don't trust these politicians, why are you so fast to like jump on the bandwagon and trust them when they lead us into these conflicts and wars? But that's a different story altogether. <laughs> yep. Excuse me. Yep. No, agreed. Uh, we don't trust them, and we don't trust the story about the seven thousand tons of gold. So, mm-hmm. but there it is. It's that well, simple. We don't trust it. We don't know where the gold is. We don't know if it's even in this country anymore. I suspect not. But uh, the Federal Reserve uh, should be very, very, very mm-hmm. interested in that seven thousand tons of gold because we owe them thirty one point five trillion dollars. You would think that they <laughs> would show some sort of interest in knowing whether or not that gold is there. <coughs> right. And and I'm not going to get into geopolitics and how that works per nation, but that's the way it works here. The yeah. Federal Reserve, literally, if that gold existed, they would have taken it by now. And <laughs> I don't think I don't think they took it because it wasn't there to take. I think the U.S. government did something squirrely with it a long time ago. Ah. Uh. I tell you what, crazy, crazy times in which we live. Um, And I'll just go back. I'll end with this. And that's why, you know, I have this little 10 ounce, 10 ounce bar. I keep, you know, this one more concept. I'm sorry. I forgot to finish up this concept. Okay. So the federal reserve has a checking account with a zero balance and they keep uh, printing up new digits and new paper currencies for us. And basically They want, they would, under normal circumstances, want our gold in exchange for that. Think about that for a second, gang. This is the most insane psychology I've ever heard of. They have nothing backing up when they're printing up or digits or paper for the United States government. And and we owe them $31.5 trillion. That's our time, our labor our sacrifice, our blood, our sweat, our tears, go to that Federal Reserve for something that they magically brought up out of nothing. And we are expected to pay for that with our blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, Everything that we are as people goes into working harder and paying taxes to pay for that money, that magic money that came out of nothing, no basis for it. So I just want people to think on that. No, and well, it I, I, and 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 that's the part that can make a guy angry, right? Yeah. Uh, that somebody can just poof, make something out of thin air, of uh, uh, you know fifty thousand dollars, right? Which right. which another person would have to, like you said right be away from their family work Mm -hmm. work on an oil rig somewhere work on a cruise ship uh work any job work at mcdonald's work at a corporate headquarters get up every morning you know go to work be away from there but somebody else can just say well i can just make this right out of thin air Uh, that's right you know uh well it goes back again i'll say this that's why i like to have a 10 ounce silver bar right because that's that's real money, and uh, that's something I can hold on. You talked about um, uh, counterparty risk, and that's mm-hmm. what when you hold gold or you hold some silver, there's no counterparty risk. There is no counterparty. I'm not relying on a bank, a government, a corporation, a neighbor. I'm not relying on Pat Holland, although I would, but I'm not. You if know, you're trading with me, I guess you would, because yeah. I, you know, I'm the risk here, you know, because I want that silver. But right. here's the deal: everyone wants silver and gold, so it's not actually a risk. So yeah. you're right. Yeah. It's called a loidial title. I forget the spelling: a l l o y d i a l, maybe a loidial okay. title, okay. and that's uh, something that uh, most people have never even heard that before. But that is basically when you purchase something, it's a, it's honest to God, 100% yours. When you acquire you something, it. land and uh, silver and gold were often referred to alloidial, as a loyal oh. title 100 years ago. So the fact that I have this in my possession means I have the alloidial title. That's I right. own the title. I own it. 
Yep. So thank, what, thank you. You transferred into something that people say today, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. My viewers love, uh, love, love that statement.